ladies and gents, thanks for coming back to us on Engineers. We've got our very own Dutch maestro here, Thomas, at Near Street, and he's going to tell you a little bit about what hopefully becomes a thing on our high streets. Okay, uh, it's pretty impressive for retailers. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the technology that sits behind uh, the business and how they're trying to innovate and not necessarily disrupt the space of retailing, but you'll come to learn a little bit more. I'll let Thomas tell you some more. So, Thomas, um, pleasure. Absolute pleasure to have you here. Thanks a lot. Great to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Do you want to give us a little bit of insight into... I guess you, the last couple of years uh, or few years at Near Street and Near Street as a business. Do you want to give us some insight and dissect a little bit about the business and the problem that you're trying to solve? Yeah, for sure. So to start off with myself, I've kind of been an entrepreneur ever since it was possible to be one. I started my first official company when I was 15, getting into the e-learning space because I, I really... So my, my thing is kind of building tools using tech that just make life easier. Uh, and most cool. of the problems that I try to attack are problems I experience myself. So being in high school, e-learning was a like, logical choice. Yeah. And that first product is a product that's only ever used by my own high school, uh, which was quite okay. cool at the time to have a, yeah, to be the only person in high school making money off their own high school. <laughs> yeah, nice. Okay. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, if only that, well, uh, I'm guessing, um, let's just say 8, 10, 12 years ago, around about that mark. No, probably not even that, actually. Slightly um, less, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, okay. I'm 23 now, yeah. <laughs> okay, nice. And that's become a thing recently. There's a shed load of money in uh, e-learning platforms at the moment, and they're all vying for the same sort of spot. So I guess you felt that challenge as well. Yeah, yeah. And so that's also one of the reasons I'm kind of glad that I'm out of that specific niche market because there's so many players there. I am still an advisor to another company that I built that does communication uh, in education. That's a slightly nice. less competitive market. But yeah, so when I was 18 and just finished high school, I then moved to London where I co-founded Near Street with two friends of mine well they became friends i i didn't really know them that well before i joined it was kind of a, a bit of a leap of faith just moving to london uh we still didn't have any investment we didn't have anything i didn't have a place to stay so i stayed on their couches for quite a bit but Did you? six years later it's still a company for some reason <laughs> and and you're still on their couch <laughs> not anymore <laughs> thanks <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thankfully okay and um th this is quite an interest th this will be quite an interesting journey that we, we explore a little bit about um you know building prototypes seeing what works seeing product fit but I i'm just keen to explore for anyone out there that's listening how did you meet these people I is it as simple as like a uh, a post uh, online to say, hey, I'm looking for some co-founders, technical or non-technical, come and get me. Or is there a, a forum? I, I don't know. Educate me. Well, so I, I get this question sometimes from other people trying to start their own companies. Like, how do you go about finding co-founders? And so far, every single time I've like done something or started off with co-founders it's always been more or less luck and randomness so my two co-founders nick and max max is also dutch uh, and he moved to london a few years before i did and he is someone that studied with someone that i consider a mentor of mine and that i had an office with back in the netherlands mm. so mm -hmm. one i think spring it was we just decided let's go on holiday to london and let's stay at this like friend of a friend's place. Yeah. And whilst there, Max kind of told me about the idea that he had, which back then was around. So he had this thing where his light bulb, bulb broke uh, above his dining table just before guests would arrive okay. for dinner. And he realized that it's super difficult to find out what local shop would have that specific light bulb. He ended up like walking around this area for 30 minutes and eventually finding out that if he had walked in the other direction, he would have found it within two minutes. Yep. And he kind of realized that it's really strange that that's still so hard these days. Like, obviously, you can just type in the type of light bulb into Google and probably find that product on Amazon and within two clicks get it delivered. 
but the delivery won't happen until tomorrow at the very yeah. uh, earliest. Um, and it's kind of strange because we have all these yeah. mini warehouses around us, these local shops, but it's completely yeah. uh, unclear what they actually have on the shelf at the moment. Um, so that's kind of how the idea for Nearstory was born. Um, ma just making visible to people what is actually available around them. Now we've been speaking for some time, actually summer last year, and still now I think I, th I think it's an unbelievable idea that that can help get footfall back onto our streets. You know, we're talking about COVID times, and we'll talk about that in the next couple of moments. But I, I think it's exactly like that scenario. It's that awareness of what's around you, what's easy to source that's around you, you'll probably go there rather than way, well, Amazon's crazy nowadays, but one, two days, right? It, it's just, it's just mm -hmm. simple. Uh, I think it's a great Yeah, it's one problem. of those things where you can't really understand that it hasn't been done before. Like you can find flights online, you can find restaurant tables online, you can find almost anything in the real world online, except for products in local shops for the most part. Um, so yeah, when we when we started five and a half years ago or so now, um, we started as a marketplace platform where uh, we had an iPhone app for shoppers to use where they could browse their nearby shops and order products to either go pick them up, yeah. clean, collect, or get them delivered within an hour. But then we realized that oh, it's, it's really difficult, of course, to maintain a marketplace because you have to, as a small company, you have to grow both sides. You need people to actually use your app, and then you also need merchants that want to offer their products on your app. So a couple of years yeah. ago, we realized that the real power of Neostreet was the fact that we have developed technology to make it super easy to get data from those shops, from shops that usually have really okay. old-style point-of-sale systems or inventory management systems that often run on a Windows XP machine somewhere yeah. in the corner. And that's where the real power is, we think, the, the data that we collect. Okay, uh, I'm really interested to understand uh, what what was that learning moment like? You said it took you a couple of years to learn that maybe a marketplace didn't work. W was that a wow? This is this is quite a good pun. Was that a, a light bulb moment? See, w was that a light bulb moment where you all looked at each other and thought maybe this isn't how the product can really work and how it's going to be so powerful? maybe it is we collect this data and we showcase it elsewhere, which we're going to talk about soon. What, what was that learning moment like? I, I, I think we had that, we, we kind of came to that notion relatively early on, probably about mm. around a year into it, because we uh, had tried a lot of different marketing techniques and we're kind of seeing that the the cost per customer just wasn't really that feasible but it then took a while for us mm -hmm. to have an actual route to go so it's, it's fine to know that your data is valuable but then what are you going to do with that data and in 2017 we got in touch with google who was like starting to really heavily invest in that in that sector and in 2018 we started an official partnership with google where we are still one of half a dozen companies or so in the world that uh, deliver them with real-time local inventory data. And that kind of solved that whole marketplace problem, of course, because it meant that we could offer our retailers an existing user base because anyone that uses Google would automatically be able to see their products. Awesome. Take us through that technical journey. You and I have spoken offline about building something quite quickly to, to test if it works, if it's what customers want, etc. cetera, in uh, PHP and iOS. And you didn't feel that was scalable for reasons we'll discover. But talk to us about that and talk to us about building that, what you're trying to explore and help us understand the mindset because th there'll be others here that... <laughs> are interested probably in doing something similar that have pet projects that maybe they want to take forward so talk, just talk us through that mindset yeah so that's that's definitely something that i consider one of my main skills is quickly building prototypes and that first year at industry was definitely that um i was the only technical person on the team and we were building uh, an ios app for shoppers that would allow you to check out uh, and order stuff for delivery we had a website that kind of did the same thing we had a 
portal for retailers. So <laughs> juggling all those things and building them, it was one of the most exhausting, but also most exciting years of my life, I think. But it's, it's definitely the code that I've written then is definitely not code that I would like anyone to ever see again. I hope it's, uh -oh. it's buried somewhere very deep. Uh -oh. um, but um, I, I do agree. Yeah, I think it's, it's super essential to to quickly prototype something, build the simplest version that you can possibly release uh, and get feedback on it. Because it's it's way too easy to to try to get something to perfection and then find out that it's not at all what your customers are looking for. Um, so yeah, yeah, the crappier the better in, in this particular instance. I like it, crappier the better. Okay, and to, uh, bef before we talk out a little bit about, I guess, what your customers do or did want, Talk us a little bit about that that technical evolution of where you are today and where you f where you feel that the technology best suits the product and maybe why you've chosen some of the technologies as well. It'd be nice to see that evolution from crap prototype, well, good prototype, but crap code, um, to where you are today. Yeah, so... Um... Like with, with most of those crap prototypes is that they usually stick around slightly too long because then you tap into something that does work and you quickly need to scale and you're not able to rebuild everything. Uh, so it took us quite a few years. I think only last year we finally got rid of the last <laughs> of the crappy PHP code. Um, but so what we gradually did is we, we first moved to uh, Node.js applications because that same, seemed more scalable than PHP because almost anything is more scalable than PHP, to be honest. But it's still one of my favorite languages even though it, it gets made fun of quite a lot but it's so easy to prototype it i think but so we we moved to node.js in a more uh, modern containerized structure and then from that about two years ago we started to move to serverless okay so especially uh, aws lambda and aws dynamodb and that has been really really good for us as a business for one it solves a lot of the scalability problems we were seeing because as we grow we're ingesting more and more inventory information from shops. We get real-time events every time a shop sells something. So we're yeah. up to somewhere in the billions of inventory updates per day now. Um, which, billions? Yes, yes. Um, wow. Which uh, is definitely not something that all PHP app would have been able to handle. <laughs> And and even containerized node applications would have been made would have taken quite a long time to make work on that scale. But now having almost everything on AWS and in a serverless structure means that we can scale that without any real problems. I don't think anyone on our team has spent any time on scalability in the past year or so, which is really amazing. And it has the added um, like advantage of. Quite a lot of our code is now event driven. So when a shop signs up, that triggers an event that then is picked up by other functions to do other tasks, like send them a welcome email, uh, send them an invoice yeah. for a sign up fee. And all of those things kind of happen asynchronously, which makes my job um, experimenting with new tech much easier as well, because I don't need to change existing code. I can just step into those existing events and leave the production code alone and not ruin anything with my crappy prototypes, basically. How did that thought, I'm, I'm always fascinated, by the way, as in that this is technically why I'm here, because I love discovering why people make those decisions and choices. Business to business, it differs, right? It differs from... I guess the domain, the challenges that they're trying to solve. But uh, why, why did you sit down? And obviously, some of it will be more obvious. Why did you sit down? Maybe let's even say Node.js versus other languages and the power that maybe they could provide. What made you choose that? And did you consult other people when choosing that? Or would you advise consulting other people when choosing tech? It's a good question, yeah. So for me, the main thing is always what is the best tool to get the job done? Uh, and obviously, that okay. depends on a lot of things. So first thing will probably be, at, at that point, we when we made that cho choice to switch from our PHP prototype to Node.js, we had almost no developers. I was still the only full-time <laughs> developer there. Yeah. And we were kind of looking at, so we're going to hire at least four people over the next year what is the language that will make that easiest uh, and at the time and probably still that was 
uh, JavaScript for us. Uh, it also really helped for me because I was already quite uh, apt at JavaScript and Node.js. Nice. And we felt like that was the most, there was a good like trade-off between simplicity and scalability, I think. And then switching to serverless was a choice of just less infrastructure management. And for some purposes, you definitely do need your own custom infrastructure. Things like heavy yeah. video processing or other things where you process a lot of data in a very custom way. Uh, we couldn't build a WhatsApp backend in serverless uh, with the same or with, with the same small latencies and things like that. But for our purpose, for most of the things that we do are kind of async and behind the scenes anyways. We yeah. get that stock information from shops. We enrich it, we create pro, uh, product profiles out of it and then send it off to Google and Facebook and other places. And all of those things, there's it's a really big pipeline and that pipeline grows quite quickly. But it, yeah. the performance there doesn't matter that much. It doesn't matter whether it's, Fine. it takes 50 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds before yeah. that event from the shop ends up at Facebook. Yeah. And, and for that purpose, serverless is just really great because it means that you don't need to care about managing infrastructure at all. Uh, and I guess thinking about it now, your, your prototype probably showed you quite a lot about what you need and what you don't need, which then you can probably simplify. Actually, like going back to your point, what's the right tool for the right job? As in, yeah, what exactly. do we really need? You know, what's important for our customers, speed, whatever else, and and make a choice based on that. Yeah, and I guess it, it kind of fits with what I was saying about finding where your value sits as a business that yeah. also then determines where the value sits in your code base. Uh, and, and I think indeed those technology choices should be made around that core thing that you're doing. Because obviously we're yeah. not only sending data to Facebook, we also have interfaces for retailers to manage those things, to create ad space on it. But that data pipeline is definitely our centerpiece. And that's what we base our technology choices on, I guess. Nice. So talk to us a little bit about the funding then this is obviously smashing news in in these times where you know it's been it's been a difficult period for businesses it's been a difficult period on retail talk to us a little bit about i guess what that funding means for you as a business what that funding means for businesses that you help share and share their inventory for yeah, so so what you're referring to is it's the fact that we in uh, January announced that we had raised another uh, two million in seed funding, which yeah. makes the total to around five point two million, I think. Nice. And what what that will really allow us to do is is grow the business to a place where we kind of feel like we found a pr uh, product market fit. Now it's just scaling shop numbers and uh, expanding to new countries. So we're really excited that we're this year finally going to expand to the U.S. Something we've been talking about for a while, but it's finally something that's uh, within reach and that we feel like we have the infrastructure for. Nice. And at the same time, indeed, especially now it's a pandemic, it's quite interesting to see the actual value we're bringing to retailers. Retailers seem okay. much more engaged with our product because they see the value that it brings and how it can actually help their their business. Yeah. And some and in some cases, actually save their business, uh, which is kind really? of sad that it's necessary, but it's it's great, of course, that we can provide some support there awesome. it, it also really changes how we look at the product especially now that uh, non-essential shops are still closed because yeah. obviously our goal has always been to actually provide in-store footfall rather than yeah. online sales which yeah. at the moment just isn't possible so we've been experimenting with allowing shoppers to reserve products through a website really and uh, expand to some other channels so we're we're quite soon in the next month or so, we're launching uh, a Facebook shop integration to all of our retailers. Awesome. Okay. Um, g just give us a bit of indication as to where or how we might see the product. You and I have spoken about it offline. I'm just trying to be conscious and, and make it aware for, for people listening. So let's just say if we're able to log on to Google and we type something near me, can you just give us an indication as to how you might come into play and help customers see what they're looking for. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's one of those things that that pivot that we made as a business kind of really changed as well, which is at the start of the business, we were trying to be a destination. We 
shop on Near Street. Whereas now we're almost invisible. You probably won't know that you're using Near Street even if you are using Near Street, which is it's quite an interesting position to be in because it means that we can focus more on what we offer retailers rather than needing to split our time between shoppers and retailers. But so yeah. um, whenever you Google a product, you might see this bar at the top of Google that shows you um, web shops that sell that product. And what we do, if Google more or less knows your location, and they have a lot of different ways of doing that, they you might see one of those cards that says uh, 0.4 miles away, telling yeah. you that that specific product is not available online, but it's actually available just around the corner from you. And that search query could be anything from a really specific product nike air max whatever but even really general things like the best whiskey to buy as a gift Ooh. and then what we also do is when you google one of the shop names of one of our retailers mm -hmm. you'll on the right always see their business information and their opening hours that sort of stuff slightly okay. further down will be a widget called see what's in store and that shows you an overview of all the products that currently have on the shelf and allows you to search in their specific inventory nice okay and do you think a lot will change with the U.S. expansion? As in, d does that make your job technically a lot more difficult? Or does it make it probably a little bit more business, operational and product difficulty? I've said that yeah. the right way. I, I, what I what are you anticipating? The... I think is basically what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. What are you guys all anticipating? So there's there's a few different challenges. On on the tech side, it's it's actually relatively simple to expand to new new places, um, which which has kind of surprised surprises as we as we grew. So we started off uh, with a pilot where we only did bookshops in London, very very okay. specific, uh, and then slowly spread across all categories across the whole of the UK. And it's kind of surprising that it holds up. It works everywhere. Nice. Shop see results no matter if they're in a really urban environment or a really rural environment um, anything from fashion to diy so it, it's quite a wide range of retails for which our technology works so in that sense i think there's not that much that will need to change um to make it work for the us the main yeah. part of our technology is integrating with all those different point of sale systems that retailers might have because that's a really fragmented market i think in the uk alone there's about a thousand companies offer point of sale, uh, offering point of sale systems to retailers. Uh, yeah. But we kind of already nailed that bar of the deck where we were able to integrate with almost any point of sale system. So then awesome. there's really just a, the business challenges you need. How are you actually going to expand? Are you going to do the whole US at once, which probably doesn't work that well because US is giant, of course. Or are you yeah. going to go with specific cities first or focus on specific categories? That's still something we're, we're kind of looking at and trying to get us some advice as well from other companies that have done the same. Yeah, nice. Um, good to see that you're leaning on some advice as well. That, that's probably quite natural. Um, nice to see that um, the technical challenges don't, don't double up, triple up, and it becomes all-encompassing, which is good, which is good. What, what do you think um, some of the hardest technical challenges were to nail? Do you think whether that was at the start, maybe building the prototype or I guess rewriting some of the platform or anything in there? You said you said there's just a serious amount of ingestion coming into the platform. Was that tough to nail? I, I think it initially was until we found the right tools. Now that we're uh, using AWS Kinesis and some of the other data tools that AWS has available, that's that's relatively simple. The thing that's then more complicated is turning that raw inventory data into something that you can actually use on the web because we usually don't get product titles okay. or images. We just get barcodes from retailers. So how do you make that something that people can actually search for in Google? So that's that's a challenge yeah. that we're currently or like constantly trying to get better at across all of those different categories of products. It's, it's really a, quite an interesting challenge as well, of course, because some product categories have quite standardized data already so books is relatively simple uh nielsen just has a, a database with all the yeah. books in the world with images but then how does that work for screws and nails in a hardware shop for example um that's that's quite a lot more difficult um so, so that's, that's a really interesting challenge 
Yeah. <laughs> that is an interesting challenge. And it, it's things like that that you don't think about. You you don't think about um, different product, different sizes, I guess. And actually, uh, I didn't know that you probably had to take some of that data and make it more actionable. So that's quite interesting to understand. Yeah, yeah. And that's definitely one of those things that our retailers really value. I remember we got this message uh, a couple of months ago from this shop who said, that it took them about a year to get 500 of their products on their own website. And then we're astounded that we were able to do all of their 3,000 products or so within a day on Google. Uh, so there's yeah, this. They were just absolutely hold over. Yeah, exactly. Because those retailers won't have that information somewhere in the database. Uh, so they're, the only way of getting the data online yeah. would be manually <laughs> inserting every single product. Nice, good. It seems like it's um, it's pretty interesting times. You've obviously got another seed round this Jan. You've got uh, the Facebook integration that that's coming quite soon. Is there anything on the horizon? Obviously, this is a tech podcast. Is there anything on the horizon that if people are interested in working with a serial entrepreneur with some expansion? Uh, are there opportunities for engineers to get involved at some point? And when do you see that potentially happening with what challenges? If that is the case right now, or if it's not decided, no worries. Uh, I, I think we'll, so there's this, this kind of two, two answers after that. So on the hiring side, I, I definitely think we'll, we'll start expanding or, or continue expanding our engineering team probably towards the end of this year, currently in, a, in quite a good place, I think, where we can like iterate relatively quickly. Uh, and I think that the area for us to focus on as a business at the moment is just growing the sales team and growing shop numbers as quickly as possible. But I definitely think we'll, we'll be hiring new engineers quite soon. Uh, and there's some really interesting challenges coming up in, in, the, in the, the small things around expanding to new countries, uh, all of the, the little include, uh, like the little details around how to optimize setup forms for a dozen different countries, how to make sure those product profiles make sense, to make sure that um, paint has a label color with a U in the UK but doesn't in the US, and just trying to abstract that into a system where it means that we don't have to worry about all of those details manually, but can kind of apply more of a like thought out uh, way to that. And then hopefully instead of only expanding to the U S thinking about how we can then as a next step, expand to 10 countries at once. And then on the other side, I'm, okay. I'm still really interested and it's not something that's super soon or uh, in our roadmap, but it will be at some point, which is an open API to make that all that inventory data that we have available, available to mm. developers to see what they can do with it. Because I think it would be great to wow. allow websites like Goodreads, for example, to not just link to a book on Amazon, but also link to Near Street and being able as a shopper to immediately see, oh, this wow. bookshop around the corner has this book available right now. When could that happen, do you think? For us, the most important thing is that it actually leads to local sales. So there are some things that we need to consider around okay. how you can abuse that data and make sure that it isn't abused to actually <laughs> do the opposite of that. But hopefully relatively soon. I, I think towards the end of the year, that will become a priority for our team. Awesome. Okay. Not that you're going to disappear from Near Street, but uh, are you working on other things at the moment? You've obviously done your e-learning thing. You've built this. Are you working on other things in the background that we might see you again at some point in the next couple of years? Yeah, although it's always a bit difficult to phrase that in a way where it doesn't seem like I shouldn't be paid my full-time salary at New Street. <laughs> but I'm also definitely working right. on some uh, some side projects. Uh, the, the biggest one is probably uh, something called Street Art Cities, which is a platform that collects that allows volunteers to collect all the street art in the world. We're currently live in about 750 awesome. cities. Um, we have an app in the App Store. And we recently wow. did a collaboration with Apple, where if you now search for street art in the Apple Maps app, you'll actually see guides from Street Art Cities coming up. I didn't expect that. Some free coverage. <laughs> I, I mean, get downloading, everyone. Get, get yeah, downloading. Sorry. sorry, that was a uh, plug without you asking if I wanted to plug anything. <laughs> please, crack on. <laughs> crack on. Um, I, I just want to say a, a big thanks. And obviously... 
chatting last summer, uh, sorry, last summer during COVID, obviously a tough time for businesses all around, especially in the retail space. It's awesome to see you come out the other side. It's awesome to see uh, a young entrepreneur making their way, building something, and there's there's value coming from it that, referring to your point, saves has saved businesses. So good on you, good on the other founders, good on everyone involved building that. And I just want to say a big thanks for coming to share your story us being able to listen about Near Street, uh, I hope a lot of engineers uh, are listening that are involved and we're obviously going to list your links below and um, your Near Street funding and other bits and pieces so people can check you out and follow what you're doing and I'm, I'm sure hopefully not abuse uh, that open API uh, at some point in the future <laughs> and use it sensibly, please everyone. Thomas, a big thanks. Thanks so much for having me. It's a lot of fun. Hey guys, thanks for watching this episode. Uh, massively appreciate you listening and checking in with us. If you want to find out more about us and what we're doing, please check us out on social media. What we're trying to do at Engineers is build a community to drive knowledge, sharing and experiences. On Twitter, we can be found at engineers.io. It's no underscore. We've also got a website, which is engineers.io. These links will all be posted in the description. Any feedback and comments are massively appreciated. We're always looking to improve on where we can. Thanks, guys.